sure that's going. Um, I said I'd spend a few minutes talking about Lord of the Rings. We're not going to. <laughs> Just don't forget uh, exam due Sunday night. Read the email that I resent this morning with a little correction because the email I sent last night said a uh, possibility about an in-person quiz on Friday. You're welcome to come and try to take an in-person quiz on Friday, but uh, we don't have class till Tuesday then. So maybe on Tuesday. Um, how many of you know how this story began? Go ahead. Well, um, it starts out talking about the Dursleys. Yeah, not how this story, oh, okay. how she came up with. Oh, she came up with it on a train in London. I forgot where she was going to, but like she had like a napkin and a pen. And it just, I forgot how it came to her, but like she wrote down like the story, like a really rough sketch of the story on this like she was, napkin. She was on a train ride from Manchester to London. All right, let me back up. Rowling grew up in the west country of England, okay, over near Gloucester, um, very near the Forest of Dean, okay, which figures prominently in Book 7. It's one of the places she and Hermione and Ron and then she and Hermione camp for a while. A um, couple of years, I don't have time for this, that's how I always get behind. A couple of years ago, actually it was, sheesh, 20... 15, early 2016. A house that J.K. Rowling lived in went up for sale. No, it was older than that. 2013. A house J.K. Rowling lived in went up for sale very near the Forest of Dean. It had been owned by an American film producer who was selling it. And included in all the description was J.K. Rowling grew up here, blah, 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 blah. And the one of the interesting things about it was not only was it near the Forest of Dean where she you know, spent an awful lot of time as a kid, but it had two interesting things that are paralleled in the Harry Potter books. It had a cupboard under the stairs, you know, where Harry sleeps, and it had a trap door to a basement, both of which, you know, we see in book one. Anyways, the guy was trying to sell it for way more than it was worth. I don't think he eventually got what he wanted. Um, She didn't go to Oxford. She wanted to go to Oxford. She couldn't get into Oxford. She went to the University of Exeter, and I'm pretty sure she studied classics and romance languages. So Greek and Latin and French and Italian, probably a little Portuguese. Got her degree or degree um, and got a job working in Portugal for Amnesty International. Okay. Her political views are, well, now they're, they're a lot more left of center than they used to be. I mean, she's, she's kind of moved farther left. Um, she met a journalist there, apparently a very handsome journalist, uh, had a whirlwind romance. I mean, real whirlwind. Like she only knew him somewhere. For some reason, I've got sinking in my mind six weeks. I can't, I just can't believe that. I think it's got to be more like six months. They got uh, engaged, married, pregnant, and when she was about six months pregnant, he dumped her. Okay? I think, by the way, that process, that image, is kind of worked out in book seven a little bit. We'll talk about it. Um, she moves back to the UK moves back to Scotland, or moves to Scotland, Edinburgh, and has her daughter, eldest daughter's name's Jessica, I think she has three kids now. And for some reason, and I, I don't think I've ever heard why, she's going to London for something. She, she's always been a writer. She's never been published, but she's always been a writer. Um, since she's like 10 years old, was writing kids' stories. She's on this train to London, and at one moment in time, she's just a single mother living on the Scottish version of welfare, you know, seemingly without two pence to rub together to her name. And the next moment, she has an idea about a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday 
that his parents were killed by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived and that that guy wants to kill him. And his name is Harry Potter. And she kind of starts to scribble what she remembers, you know, that stuff. And she begins working on the first Harry Potter novel. Before she publishes the first Harry Potter novel in 1997, she has seven boxes of notes for all seven books. She has a box of notes that became Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, a box of notes that will become Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, all the way down to the end. Okay? Because she thought from the outset, after she begins you know, fleshing out the idea a little, little bit, she comes to the conclusion this needs to be a seven book series. One of the reasons, she said in one interview, was because there are seven Chronicles of Narnia. And C.S. Lewis was one of her favorite authors. Okay? Seven Chronicles of Narnia, seven Harry Potter novels. Cool. She finishes the first draft. She revises it. She writes it primarily at two different locations in Edinburgh, two different cafes, one called The Elephant. I can never remember that one. Every time I've gone to London, I've taken students for my Appeal of Harry Potter course. We go to Edinburgh. We go on the uh, Elephant Cafe. For some of the time, it had been turned into a Chinese restaurant, which was very weird, you know, having this Chinese thing with all this Harry Potter stuff. And weird, weird decoration. You, it's probably still there. You can go there and see it. Pictures of the Harry Potter cast, like on the toilet seat, like decoupaged. And on the seat cover, on the inside and top, I have no idea why, but <laughs> there it is. Um, she finishes final draft. She gets some support from the Scottish Humanities Council to write the novel, okay? Anybody know how many rejection letters she got? How many different publishers she sent it to before Bloomsbury agreed to publish it? There's a range of numbers. It ranges between several and a lot. It's like from 12 to 20 something. I think the most I've seen is something like 26. The, the number I've seen most often is 21. She is rejected 21 times before Bloomsbury agrees to publish it. I told my first class, she is made of sterner stuff than me. Because if it were me, five rejection letters, I'd probably forget about it. Imagine being one of those 21 acquisitions editors. <laughs> you turn down Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. That within 10 years, a publication of the first novel would earn its author billions of dollars and would earn its publishers tens of billions of dollars. Authors get a relatively small portion. If the book's selling for like 10 bucks, authors get maybe two bucks. All the rest goes to the Publish, goes for publishing, printing, marketing, all that kind of stuff, okay? So it's first published in 97. Book two, Chamber of Secrets, comes out in 98. Book three, Order, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, 99. Book four, 2000, and then you have a break. Of about two years, okay? Anybody know when the first <clears throat> release party was? For which book? It was book four, okay? When book one was published, it was published with zero marketing. They didn't market it at all because they didn't know whether or not it was, it was gonna sell. And it had a pretty small print run. If you can find a first printing, so if you were to open your book and it has these numbers down here, if all it had was one, that would mean you've got first printing. If you got a first printing, first edition, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, um, you want to put that sucker in a safety deposit box. Because that's worth probably forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Okay? <clears throat> Second book is published. Well, okay, so the first book is published and there's no marketing. How do people know to buy it? Word of mouth. Appearance in a bookstore 
They see it, you know, they read a little bit, they think maybe your kid will be interested, buy it for the kid, the kid reads it, the kid just devours it. Loans it to a friend, friend tells his or her parents, their parents buy it for them, that's how the first book sold. That's pretty much how the second book sold too. They did minimal advertising for the second book. By the third book, it had already been bought for the United States market by Arthur A. Levine slash Scholastic Books, and it started showing up in those little scholastic things that are given to kids in grade school. You know, go beg and whine and cajole your parents to buy you all these books, you know, so that you can get your AR reading points and all that kind of nonsense, right? It's with the fourth book that the massive advertising comes out, okay, in 2000. I first heard about it in 99. Driving into work, listening to NPR, it's when I listen to NPR, the bureau, the NPR London bureau chief, a guy named T.R. Reid, who's a good journalist, was talking about this new book series that's kind of taking England by storm. And he compared it to C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia by denigrating the Chronicles of Narnia. <clears throat> he said, this book is, you know, it's not all that preachy Christianity and allegory, blah, blah, blah. It's exciting, it's got magic. And I immediately, once he, you know, cast shade on Lewis, I kind of, because I'm here because of Lewis and Tolkien. I found out about that. I thought that's what I want to do because I like to read and talk about books. And I thought that's all that was involved. Naive me. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I'm not going to look at this. A few weeks later, I was at Sam's Club and they had a big display of the Harry Potter novels because book three had just come out Harry Potter and Prisoner of Azkaban. So I picked up the first one and literally read like the first page. And I mean, she had that hook so far down in me. I, I, I went on to stand there and just read the first chapter. Bought it, read it that day. Went back the next day and got the next two. And started teaching them, I think, a year later. So I was teaching them before I even knew where she was going kind of with them. Okay? When book four came out, it was the first time in history that... The most widely selling book ever at that time was a book that you could not physically handle. That is, you, you couldn't hold it because it wasn't published yet. It was available to say for, available for sale on Amazon. Um, I think a month or so before it was even published. And it was the number one selling book. Now, this is way back when Amazon was really young and small. Is when Jeff Bezos still had hair, you know. <laughs> still had his first wife. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was up until just a few years ago. Anyways, when it came out, excuse me, before it even came out, before you could even hold the book, it was the number one book on the New York Times bestseller list. Okay? And if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. I'd have to go back and check. Two, three, and four were the other three books. When the next book came out, summer of 2002, I believe it was, she was already remarried at this point because she gave an interview and she talked about coming down and telling her husband, oh, I shouldn't say that. I can't say that about something she wrote in the novel and she just had tears coming down her face. And this was like a month and a half before you could get Order of the Phoenix in your hands. That's why everybody's wondering, what does this mean? Anyways, when that book came out in 2002, you then had the first five spots on the New York Times bestseller list all being Harry Potter books. I don't think they left the New York Times bestseller list between book four and book five. I think they still retained one through four. I think it's when book six came out, 2005. There might have been earlier, it was in preparation for book six. The New York Times bestseller list changed their methodology for listing books. They said they have to be adult books. <coughs> We're not going to put children's books at the number one or at the, on the bestseller list. Even though the books were the bestsellers. 
they far outsold what the other adult bestsellers were. I mean, by hand over fist, just huge amounts. Um, you know, by 2007, I think it is, once all seven books are out, I think she had sold by then something like over 400 million copies of the books. That's how she went from being penniless to being the richest woman in Great Britain by 2007, okay? Um, when the books first came out in the United States, when the first book came out, there was some discussion about it, but not greatly. It was only really when books two and books three got really popular and started being sold in the scholastic stuff that went out, you know, kids in grade school. Because you, I'll use my, our family as an example. When our kids who went to all public schools would come home with a scholastic thing, you know, they'd say, we want to get, and so what my wife or I would do, or usually both of us together, we'd go through and look through all the books. Well, one of the things that happened, and I don't mean to disparage anybody, well, let me rephrase that. I don't mean to disparage anybody personally, okay? But as a group, I do mean to disparage a group of people. Extremely fundamentalist Christians had a huge problem. Kind of beginning with books two and three. It goes back to book one, however, because of the idiot American publisher who changes the title, which we'll talk about. So what problems did the extreme fundamentalist Christians have? What was the problem? Magic. Magic. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Spells. Potions. Maybe you guys didn't do this. I've had students before who've all said, oh yeah, you know, we would make little wands, cut a thing off a tree, and you know, <laughs> and it wouldn't be... <laughs> It wouldn't be, you know, Imperio or Expelliarmus. It'd be Avada Kedavra. <laughs> I grew up during the Vietnam War. My brother and I would use baseball bats and pretend they were M1s and bazookas. <laughs> Pop up behind a tree, boom! You're dead, you know. You're not even there anymore, you know. Kind of a thing, okay? Violence is wound into our nature, whether you like that or not. So what did they start to do? Did they just individually say, no, Johnny, you can't have this book. Give it back to Fred or take it back to the school library. They started burning books. They burned. There were literal book burnings, okay? And parents would call and ask for the school library to remove the books from the library because I don't want Susie to read this book. That means... Joni and Julie and Maxine and all the other girls can't either, and boys too, okay? Question. Um, is that banning a book? By asking a library to remove a book from the library shelves, is that the same Okay, let me rephrase that. Literally as banning the book. No. Why not? Because you're asking for it to be removed. It's not like the same as saying this book is not allowed. Okay, every one of you who said no, you are in direct opposition with the American Library Association, which says that is banning. It's not. Only one, what? For lack of a better word, power can Bam. What's that power? Who has? The school district? No, not even. It's higher than that. Just like government. Yeah, you, you, Only government can lit. I mean, if we go back to what the word really means, can ban books. How does it do it? Books removed from any school or any library and saying these are not allowed for these reasons, and if you're caught, you could get fined or fired or whatever. Okay, but it's that's that's the beginning. They'll write into like a wall or something. Every one of the books last week or two weeks ago was National Band Book Week or American Library Association Band Book Week. I can't remember what it's called. 
Um, every one of the books that is on that list of banned books, like Huckleberry Finn, a couple of these, the Bible, Catcher in the Rye, you know, a whole bunch of other really bad books. Hunger Games, you know. Can you buy them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can buy them anywhere, almost anywhere you want. Amazon, <laughs> Bible banned. It's been banned by schools. Why? Because of separation of church and state. Yeah, but that's the stupid reason. What's the, <laughs> what's the real reason that's often given? There's like more violence in the Bible than I think a lot of people realize. Okay, violence. Really? I mean, look around. There's violence everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, get, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Because Premarital sex. Incest sex. <laughs> I mean, violence. come on. Like it's Jesus is descended from incest sex on Mary's part. Abraham's children, you know, they all screw up. <laughs> Literally and figuratively kind of, okay? That, that's, that's one of the big reasons. It's not language, okay? And it's, yeah, there is the violence, but it's the sex stuff that just, you know, Well, yeah, or they do and choose not to look at it kind of a thing. So, but you can still buy the Bible. Go to any hotel room in America and you're going to find a copy of the New Testament in the little drawer that the Gideons are going to put there. Okay? All these books can still be bought. Um, so by removing them from the shelves, that's not literally banning. Okay, it's not censorship either. Censorship can only happen from the government down. That's why the First Amendment takes care of it, right? Kind of bans censorship. That's the only kind of banning there is, so to speak. Okay? Are there any kind somebody in my first class, you know, I asked a question about books or other places. And she mentioned, you know, does China ban the Bible? And I said, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure you can get a copy of the Bible in China. Do the Chinese authorities? encourage that? No. That, their whole ESG score stuff, if you're caught purchasing a Bible or reading a Bible or having one in public, uh, they're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. Okay, Our government's not going to come down on you like a ton of bricks for walking around with Harry Potter or with the Bible or with Marx's Communist Manifesto or Das Kapital or pick your banned book kind of thing. Okay? In 2001, 2002, okay? So let me back up for just a minute. So you did have groups literally burning the books, okay? And you had people figuratively burning J.K. Rowling. I mean, with some things that were said about her, it's almost like if they had a lighter and some lighter fluid, she'd be torched. <clears throat> in 2001, 2002, she gave an interview with a reporter from the Vancouver Sun, a newspaper up in Vancouver, Canada. And the reporter, you know, asked her a bunch of questions and said, you know, are you a Christian? And Rowling kind of hemmed and hawed. She didn't really want to answer the question, but she eventually said, yes, I am. And the reporter asked, you know, what, what flavor, what variety are you? <laughs> What denomination? Are you Catholic? Are you Orthodox? Are you Protestant? If you're Protestant, what of the 22,000 denominations in the Protestant church are you? And again, she kind of didn't want to answer, but she said Church of Scotland, Presbyterian in other words. And a reporter said, okay, how does your, how does your Christianity inform the Harry Potter novels? At this time, she'd only had four of them written. She still had three to go. And Rowling, again, kind of demurred, but she eventually spat out, well, if I were to answer that, it would give away the ending. Okay? And a re reporter was like, oh, no, that's interesting. Because what does that imply? Somehow, Christianity is involved with the course of the novels. And yet, a group of Christians, I'm not, they're not a sizable majority by any chance. They're not even a majority, I would say. But a group of Christians, a loud, let's put that, a loud group of Christians wanted to burn her books. And she was kind of like, 
well, my books, hmm. And she wouldn't answer. She wouldn't say, well, I'm going to have Jesus come alive at the end. And redeem all the, you know, sorcerers. And she doesn't do that at all. If you look for Jesus in the Harry Potter novels, you will not find him. If you even look for the name, it's not there. You look for Mary, Joseph, saints, plural, like saints in the Christian church, you won't find. You will find the word saint a few times, beginning with book five and going to the end. And it's used once in this book, God, but it's spelled according to Hagrid's dialect. G-A-W-D. And a lot of people, because it's spelled that way, completely miss it. The name God, the word God, doesn't really, again, show up, I think, until it's either four or five, and then it just starts showing up a lot in six and seven. When book seven came out, I, I'm hoping to get us up to the Mirror of Erisic. I know we're, that means we're not going to finish, but... We'll finish the rest of it pretty quickly on Tuesday. Um, when book seven came out, and I can't remember his name, a fantasy novelist slash literary critic did an interview for the New York Times with J.K. Rowling. And he asked her, where is God in book seven? He, he seems to be totally absent. And her response, which I thought was just acid, I mean, just snarky and whip-like, was, I don't think he's as absent as you think he is. So why do I say that's acid and snarky? Okay, this guy's a literary critic, and she's essentially saying, you're not as good a reader as you think you are, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just because the name or word God shows up a lot. In that book, it's usually, thank God, thank God, thank God, in that context, every time, okay? And then he goes on and he writes an article for the New York Times <clears throat> that essentially said, God is missing in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, and J.K. Rowling killed him. Sorry? <laughs> I'll try to find the article and I'll post it, okay? And I read it and I thought, after I read the novel, I thought, this guy's totally clueless. <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, it's like far right wing conservatives and far left wing um, progressives. It's like they have two totally different worlds. Because these people see one thing, and these people look at the same thing, and it's like they see the ex it's, it's the example I used in class that one day, holding up my phone. You see one thing, I see something totally else, totally different kind of thing, okay? Um, and it's, it's just amazing how obtuse, I'll say, he is, okay? So, um, anything else about that background? So, like I said, she goes from being penniless, essentially, to being a billionaire in 10 years. First book's published in 97, last book's published in 2000, last book of the novels, not the Fantastic Beast and the, um... Curse the Child? The, no, oh. Yeah, I know. Don't even know. <laughs> no, the other little, um, not the fantastic, uh, the other little tiny book that was written book? for charity. The Quidditch book? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you have read anything else by her? Other than the cursed book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the book that shall not be named. Yes, <laughs> <by the book. laughs> Last time I was in London, I had students who saw The Cursed Child. And they all said, oh, man, the staging is wonderful. And I was like, but the story's horrible. <laughs> I got a copy, first edition, first printing, the whole nine. I think we have three. <laughs> They're not going to be worth anything because it's horrible. I mean, it's sorry if you like it. The book that sucks. It's bad. <laughs> it's Everyone really, hates it. So it's, really, it's really bad. It's really I've bad. never met a single person who's like, oh, I love that book. <laughs> yeah. And she didn't write most of it. She helped the others write it. Anyways, have you ever read any of her detective novels? Hardman. Add another book. Her latest one came out. I haven't read it yet. It's an 
thousand plus pages in these aren't Harry Potter novels. What she shows in these novels is she is a master. I mean, not many people do better at plot. Her plots are so intricate, by the time you get to the end, you're like, okay, I need a map to this thing to try to figure out where we are. And she ties them all. I mean, she's a superb mystery slash, they're not really mysteries. They're detective novels. I mean, where there's somebody gets killed. And the latest one kind of brings in her current controversies with the trans community in, in um, England. Well, some people say it brings in. She says it was written before all that latest kerfuffle. The American editor in 97, or am I? The American editor in 97, in his infinite wisdom, that's sarcasm, by the way, um, convinced J.K. Rowling to change the title for the American edition to Sorcerer's Stone. What's the real title? Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. What is the Philosopher's Stone? I mean, what is the thing itself? It's, it's a stone. That makes you live forever. You can use it to make something to make you live forever, and you can use it to make, is any of this metal? That is. You can use it to turn base metal into gold. Okay? We can do that now without a philosopher's stone. You could turn lead into gold. You could turn tin into gold. It's just prohibitively expensive. It's cheaper to go off to Sierra Nevada, go digging around in some river, and try to find gold that way, okay? How old is the idea of the Philosopher's Stone? Anybody know? Years? It goes back thousands of years. They were searching for it in China. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure we have evidence going back to about 3000 BC. Okay. The Egyptians wrote about it, like 1500, 2000 BC. It's mentioned, if I remember correctly, in some Indian mythology. So it's, it's not just something, you know, some Westerner dreams up one day to make himself rich and immortal. It is an actual real idea in, year, in what's called Europe... Uh, human intellectual history. People thought this thing was real. They tried to make it or tried to find it for thousands of years, okay? It gets its big jump, so to speak. It's big PR push when, anybody know? Middle Ages. What rises in the Middle Ages? What branch of science comes into its own in the Middle Ages? Alchemy. Alchemy. And a practitioner of alchemy, what's called an alchemist. Okay? And alchemists, by the way, it's out of alchemy that our, some of our modern sciences come, like chemistry, astronomy, um, some branches of medicine. The alchemists were the ones who messed around with herbs and plants, as well as people who were called witches. Okay? They natural plant healers and such. Homeopathic medicine would have put you on a stake or on a bonfire a thousand years ago. So alchemists. Alchemists didn't want to create the source, <clears throat> the philosopher's stone, to get rich and live forever. That's what its surface meaning is that you can use it to create an elixir, let me use an Italian uh, Latin phrase, an aqua vitae, a water of life, <laughs> that as long as you keep drinking it, you will never die. It wasn't one sip and that's it, you live forever, right? You had to keep, keep drinking. Nor would it, you know, turn any old metal you have, at surface level, it would turn any old metal you have into gold. Well, big deal, that's not what they were concerned with. They were concerned with transformation, because both of those involve transformation. Mortality and immortality, base metal to pure metal, 
are about transforming things. They were concerned with this transformation. I don't mean this, I mean what's inside. Immortality was about gaining immortality for the soul. And the transformation from base to pure was about the transformation of the soul from being stained, dirty, rotten, a.k.a. Garden of Eden results, to pure, good, holy. But doing it without having to go through, you know, the auspices of the church, so to speak. Okay? So that's what the philosopher's stone is and does. What does the sorcerer's stone do? What is its history in human intellectual history? There is none until 1997, when an idiot publisher changes the title of a book from the Philosopher's Stone to the Sorcerer's Stone. Why change the title? Because the Native Americans wouldn't understand it. Really close. He told J.K. Rowling, American parents would never buy a book for their children that had the word philosopher in the title. And it's because Americans historically are known as a group. Hey, I am very much, not very much, I am 100% against an idea of group identity. That is because you fit a group, you are only that group. No, look at individuals, look at people, not, okay? He said, Americans as a group are, and this, this isn't just him, this is how the Brits view us. This is how a lot of Europeans view us. We are anti-intellectual. We're nothing but a bunch of redneck rubes. <laughs> and we don't like no books that have the word philosophy. <laughs> we, don't like, we don't like philosophy. Because philosophy is what? Literally, the word means love of wisdom. And everybody knows Americans ain't that, <laughs> that wise, okay? That's the reason why the title is changed. It's asinine. It is stupid. Okay? They also change other words. They have to change Britishisms because Americans don't understand Britishisms. If you had picked up a copy of the English edition in 1997 and you're reading about somebody being handed a packet of crisps, you'd probably go, it's a potato chip. <laughs> or a piece of cellophane tape. It's scotch tape. And there's all other kinds of words. I think it's beginning around book five or book six. They stop changing those British terms. And they keep them. For example, we're going to hear the word Burke. There is no American equivalent. It's a unique British word. You can say it's jerk plus something else okay the word i won't use students do a lot it has to do with male anatomy okay um and that's about the closest we can get because we don't have something that fits it exactly okay anyways um i'm going to talk about the ring envelope structure in just a moment two more things Wait, um, two more things. Rowling's Harry Potter novels are chock full of symbolism. So be ready for it. Okay? Little things are symbolic, highly symbolic. For example, Gryffindor, the name, is symbolic because of its derivation, as is Voldemort, as is Draco, Malfoy, etc. Gryffindor comes from, notice I changed the spelling to the traditional English spelling for the word Griffin. Griffin de or. De or is French, of gold. Right? The da is really D-E, but you drop the E, the or. So that's of gold. What is a griffin? It's an eagle and a lion. Combined, head, shoulders, kind of, of an eagle, body of a lion with an eagle's wings. 
we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about why and how it is symbolic. Draco, dragon, Malfoy, French, Malfoy, bad faith. Without giving too much away, who do the Malfoys put their faith in? Volde, American pronunciation, Voldemort. Because we pronounce those final consonants. If you're French, you don't pronounce final consonants. So it's Voldemort. Vol, from Latin volare, to fly or flee. De, away from, of, mort, death. To fly or flee from death. What's the one thing that motivates Lord Voldemort? Not dying. Okay? I mean, just all kinds of things. But then, little things. We're going to see Harry's wand is just chock full of symbolism. As is Voldemort's wand. Okay? So names are important, things can be important, etc. Uh, okay, first, first page. Like I said, I'm going to try to get us through or to when Harry's looking into the mirror of Erised, because that's going. We're going to slow down there and spend about 10, 15 minutes. And I can almost guarantee some of you, your eyes are going to go boop as we start to talk about it. So, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, we're proud to say that they're perfectly normal. Thank you very much. What's the thank you very much mean? Is it needed? No, it's not. Why does she include it? Because of Okay, why else? Entitlement. Louder? Entitlement, okay. It's British. That is a Britishism. But it doesn't get dropped. It doesn't have the effect on us that it does on an English reader. Because an English reader is used to hearing that kind of statement all the time. And it's usually in a somewhat kind of sarcastic mode or vein. Yes, I would like that. Thank you very much. In other words, shut the hell up. That's kind of what it implies, okay? <clears throat> Stay open. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious. Why? Because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. So, anything strange or mysterious for them equals nonsense. So describe the Dursleys. What don't they... What kind of... I can't even think of a way to put the question. What to them is nonsense? Other than just, don't just say things that are strange or mysterious. Give me an example of strange or mysterious things. Magic. Magic? What else? The cat reading the map. Cat reading the map would be, you know, kind of strange. What else? Doesn't have to be from the book. The paranormal. UFOs, right? Why are the people interested in UFOs? Because they're unidentified. We don't know what they are. Strange and mysterious. What other things? A little more down to earth. Both literally and figuratively. What about things you can't see? Aren't things? Notice the question presumes. <laughs> that you accept that there are things you can't see. And I don't mean, you know, out there, like, you know, comets and stuff that we can't see. I mean, here. Hmm. So, we get a description of, I'm not going to answer that, by the way, I just want you to think about it. We get a description of Mr. Dursley, who runs a big firm, a big drill-making firm, who has a big, fat, beefy, uh, with hardly big fat beefy man with hardly any neck. Sorry, I threw in fat there. I probably shouldn't have. He's a big beefy man. I think that kind of applies. <laughs> um, but his wife is thin and blonde and has nearly twice the usual neck. Why? Because she stands there using it to look over the fence and spy on her neighbors. So describe the Dursleys. Describe Petunia Dursley. 
nosy. Aren't other people's business strange and mysterious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's trying to figure those out. Okay. And you can't get more prosaic. You can't get more down to the real world than being the manager of a company that makes drills. What do drills do? Or let me rephrase that. We're not, we don't know if that actually means drills, the machine that you put a drill bit into, or if it means the drill bits. Because drill bits, you used to do what? Bore or drill a hole. And if you've got a, something deep to go through, it's just this constant, it's boring. Pun in there. Okay, that kind of describes the Dursleys. But this day isn't going to be boring for them. Vernon goes off to work. He overhears conversations. He runs into a guy wearing a cloak, and he overhears the voice or the name Potters. Their son, Harry. He goes back to work. He starts to think. Harry Potter. That's not his name. No, his name is Henry. He goes home, talks to his wife. Heard from your sister lately? This is on page seven. No, what? And he talks about the funny stuff on the news, the owls, the shooting stars, etc. cetera. Uh, they've got a son, right? Yes. Be about Dudley's age, right? Yes. You're younger. What's his name? Harry, common name. Really? Like Dudley is an elevated name? <laughs> Or Vernon, you know, it's just majestic, like Reginald Lewis, Dursley, the, no, it's, you know, about as common as you can get, okay? Page eight. They go to bed, and there's a man, a man appears on the corner, and there's the cat that we haven't talked about that's been sitting outside the house. The man appears on the corner, and we're told nothing like this person had ever been on this corner. Why not? I mean, we can't answer that at this point, but you can if you've read the rest of the novel. How un dursley ish un ish un drive-ish is Albus Dumbledore? Very Harry. About as un as you could be, right? In other words, he's about as strange and mysterious as you can get. How do we know? Because he just appears. Notice we're not told he walks and turns the corner. He just appears. Okay? And what does he do? He pulls out something that looks like a cigarette lighter and goes, and boop, 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 boop. The street lights all go out. He goes and talks to the cat, who we find out is not a cat. Professor McGonagall. She says, how do you know it's me? I love this. Page nine. I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. <laughs> I mean, if you know cats, cats are like what? They're moldable. They're, you know, they're floppy. They're, floppy. they're like they don't have any bones. They run In the old Charlie bones. Brown cartoons and one of the later ones, somebody had a cat named Farron and it was described as a boneless cat. I think it was Sally. Sally would pick the cat up and it would be like wet noodles. Just, okay? She is like sitting at attention. So they talk. And she says, top of 11, if you know who has gone, my dear professor, all this you know who nonsense. It gets so confusing. I've never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. He doesn't say here what he's going to tell Harry, I think it is, later on. Fear of the name of the thing does what? Increases the fear of the thing itself. Kind of like FDRs, all we have to fear is fear itself. Quit fearing fear. What does that mean? Live. Okay, so... She says, you know, you're different. Everybody knows you're the only one he's ever been afraid of. He says, you flatter me. 
Voldemort had powers I will never have, only because you're too well noble to use them. Notice her phrasing kind of implies what about Dumbledore? Not the nobility part. He has the power, but he just... You could. You have that ability. You just don't do it. Okay? And he blushes. So they go on, keep talking. She mentions Godric Tallow, Lily and James Potter. They're dead. What about his son? Godric Hollow. The name, Godric, comes from Old English. It's related to Germanic. Okay? God, leave this part off for a second, can be either, depending on the pronunciation in the Old English, because the spelling of the two words is the same, God could be either God, or it could be God, good. Okay? Reef. We see that used most prominently today if you're talking about Hitler and his rise. Because Hitler wanted to institute or start what? The Third Reich. The Third Kingdom. The Second Kingdom was Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire. The First Kingdom was the First Empire of Rome. Tells you how whacked out Hitler was. He thought he was going to start a third Roman Empire of sorts. Was it going to be Roman? It was going to be Germanic, right? So, Reich, Reich, Rick, is related to Reich. You see it in the word bishopric. It's about the only place we see it written today in that form. Kingdom. So, it's either the kingdom of good, or good, apostrophe S, kingdom, is its etymological meaning, or God's kingdom. What's the other part? Hollow. It's a famous Protestant hymn going back to at least the 1970s. I would lay money that J.K. Rowling knew it. He's got the whole world in his hands. What do you do? You form a hollow. So, the hollow of the kingdom of God. That's Godric's hollow, all right? Which we're going to see some interesting happen when things happen when we get to Godric's hollow in book seven. So, they keep talking, and Dumbledore tells her, Harry's being delivered here. She's like, no, 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 you don't understand, not here. Not to these people. Page 13. Okay. You can't. I've been watching them all day. You can't find two people who are less like us. And they've got this son, I mean. It's the best place for him. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written him a letter. What does that show us on Dumbledore's part? Doesn't think clearly. Anything. Not thinking clearly? Possibly. What else? Uh, he's too easy to trust. Too easy to trust. The word for that is gullible. What's another way of putting it? I mean, you're exactly right. If somebody's gullible, what else are they? They're naive. What is he thinking about the Dursleys? That they're family and they'll take care of them. That they'll be good. That they will act like he would do. We're going to have a character say later on, ha, oh, decent people. They're so easy to manipulate. Why? Because they think other people will act decently. They don't think other people will be SOBs. So, she's like, a letter? Hello? This kid will be famous. These people won't understand him. He'll be a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. What day is this? We don't know yet. We find out later. What day on the calendar is it? Tuesday. Halloween. The day after Halloween. It was last night that Voldemort went to Godric's Hollow and killed the Dursleys. Potters, sorry. <laughs> killed the Potters. The day after All Hallows' Eve, Halloween is All Hallows' Eve, so if it's the Eve, the next day is All Hallows' Day. That's what this is. All Hallows' there just means saints. 
All Saints Day. It's the day in the church, whether you're talking, Protestant church doesn't do it, the Catholic church or the Orthodox church, it's the day where all the saints of the church are commemorated. And that's not necessarily all the named saints. That's all the Christians who died throughout history, period. All right? And even some people who weren't Christians when they died because they didn't know Jesus, per se, like David and Samson and Moses. Okay? All Saints Day. She says, just, I wouldn't be surprised if this day in the future is called Harry Potter Day. In a later book, Harry is going to be called a saint by a character. Okay? Just let that perk. Remember, she said, I can't answer that question because it'll give away where the books are going. While Christians are wanting to burn her at the stake and burn her books because she's not Christian enough. Okay? Dumbledore. Exactly. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember. No, no, no. He'll be better here. Imagine for a moment, play a you know, thought experiment. Dumbledore doesn't take Harry, doesn't have Hagrid bring Harry, to the Dursleys. He has him taken to the Weasleys. And he's raised by the Weasleys with all the brothers and the sisters. You, <laughs> much later on, don't go there, okay? But assume for the moment he is raised there. How would he be raised? With magic. With magic, keep going. Knowing he was famous. And how often would he hear that? If you know anything about Fred and George and Ron, every single day, I mean, maybe think about Bill and Charlie and Percy and Jenny. Jenny would just be. <laughs> Fred, Ron, and George, they would be what? Man, they'd be talking Harry up all the time. And probably encouraging him, right? Harry, try your magic on George, you know? <laughs> Fred and George would have definitely tried to let it get out of him at what, what would have happened to him? He'd be so full of himself, we could rename him. Draco Malfoy. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Malfoy Potter, you know, kind of a thing, okay? So Dumbledore's got his reasons. By the way, the name Albus White, and we're going to see him in book four, kind of Dumbledore uncloaked, Dumbledore the White, okay? Dumbledore is from the old English word for bumblebee. Notice, b b d d It's the same kind of principle that worked there. Why? Why in the world would you name somebody a white bumblebee? I'm not saying there's great significance to the name bumblebee. Well, what do bumblebees do? They flit around from one flower to another, gathering nectar, pollen, and such. The implication is never resting, always in movement. And the more and farther and farther we get into books, what do we discover about Dumbledore? It's always seemingly, my terminology, sorry if you don't like it, not really, but sorry if you don't like it, he's moving the chess pieces on the chessboard. He's kind of like, well, you were meant to have the ring. I'm not saying he's God, don't, don't get me wrong there. Definitely not. Um, so we get introduced to Hagrid, Hagrid brings Harry. How does Hagrid bring Harry? Be more specific. A motorbike with a sidecar. Be more specific. Where does he get the bike? Does he go to motorbike? Yeah, you can say Sirius Black. He gets it from Sirius Black. Rowling writes these seven books and follows what's called in a ring or envelope structure. That is, think of a big circle, and then think of another circle, and then think of another circle, and a bullseye in the middle. Book one has parallels, balanced scenes with book seven. I'll give one away. Harry arrives at number four, Privet Drive, with Hagrid on a flying motorcycle. Harry leaves number four, Privet Drive, with Hagrid on a flying motorcycle. It ends there. That balance. There are other balances between book one and book seven. Book two, 
has balanced scenes with book six, book three has balanced scenes with book five, but book four kind of sits off on its own. Why? Because book four is kind of like these hinges. Okay? Everything in books one through three leads to, builds to book four. Everything in five through seven kind of flows from book four. All right? It's the linchpin for them. It's also where the books become much, much more what? Dark, dark. Adult. Adult. One through three, nobody dies. Before we get our first death, and then the bodies start to pile up. It becomes like a tragedy. All right? So, chapter two, I'm not going to say anything you're really about. Harry recounts a dream he had. Vernon goes, hey, you know what, crazy? And Harry's like, chill, man, it's just a dream. Why does Vernon go crazy? Because of it's magic. It's nonsense. Motorcycles don't fly. Basic laws of physics. Come on, kid. They go to the zoo. Harry talks to the snake. Nonsense. And this is where we get our first time. We're rolling show. She's not a great writer. And where we see she doesn't have a great copy editor either working on the manuscript at Bloomsbury because there's an error made in the scene in the reptiles. Anybody know what the error is? It's not a spelling or something like that. It's, a, it's something that occurs there. When I was a little kid from, a, from about from when, you know, like first grade when I was first starting to read kind of books and stuff, up through, I don't know, 10 years, 11 years, maybe 12 years old, I wanted to be a herpetologist. Anybody know what that is? Reptile? Somebody who studies snakes. Not just reptiles, snakes. I love snakes. All kinds of snakes. I'd get on my bike and I'd ride down, you know, I was like eight years old. I'd ride down to the pet store about a mile away. This is when eight-year-olds could do that kind of thing. <laughs> Cross a bunch of busy streets, you know, like Old Fort Parkway during high traffic, just oh zip in between, you know. Good God. Because there was a guy who worked at the pet store who had a rattlesnake. And he'd pull it out. And I could, you know, touch its head and it's rattled, you know, because he kept its mouth closed. <laughs> Crazy, right? There's a problem with the snake. Yes? It winks. Snakes can't wink. Snakes don't have movable eyelids. They do have an eyelid, but it's solid. It's transparent. It's what keeps the eye lubricated, but they don't have anything that comes down. She should have known that. And if she didn't know that, not meaning she would, you know, should have been a nerd herpetologist, but she did research. Her copy editor should have caught that. Okay? Not major, it's not all that big and important. It's the kind of thing Tolkien would have revised out. Okay? Don't misunderstand me. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Tolkien is a great writer. He pays attention to every single word. Rowling is a great storyteller. There's a huge difference between the two. I mean, she could probably just sit down around the campfire and tell you this story, and you wouldn't want to get up and leave for anything. And she could probably then riff on all different, you know, other stories, okay? So they go back home, and Harry's now in trouble, right? And what happens next chapter? The letters from no one. Harry gets a letter one morning. He's like, I can't believe this. He's never had a letter. Vernon yanks it out of his hand. What happens the next day? He gets another letter. He gets another letter. Actually, I believe there's more than one. It slipped under the door. First one came through the mail slot in the door. Next day, they come down the fire, the chimney. Okay? They come through the windows. When should the Dursleys realize they're not going to be able to escape these dreaded letters? I mean, when, what specific... It's one time when the letters arrive. 
When should they realize they had better learn to put up with the strange and mysterious? Is it when the owls come in? No. It's when the eggs are delivered. Now, a student in my first class made a mistake. She said, you know, when the letters come in the carton, and I kind of went, and she goes, oh, no, no. When the letters come in each egg, how do you get a chicken to lay an egg with letters in it or in them? You know you're not in Kansas anymore, you know, Dorothy. I mean, that's a different world kind of thing. Vernon should throw his hands up and go, okay, kid, you're a wizard. <laughs> Your parents didn't die in a car wreck. They weren't drunk. I'm going to be drunk in the next five minutes. <laughs> because if you were Vernon, as we find out in book three, Vernon likes to put it away. Okay? So... They leave the house because the dreaded letters won't stop coming. They go away. They go to a hotel. That morning, about 100 letters arrive. They go off to the hut on the rock, on the sea, off the coast of Britain, northern hemisphere, planet Earth, you know, etc. When do they realize, when do they discover they can't escape Harry's destiny, for lack of a better word? At 12.01 a.m., July 31st. Harry's 11th birthday. Harry's 11th birthday. Notice the letters start coming. But Harry's only 10. He hasn't turned 11 yet. Okay? And Hagrid kicks down the door. Skipping a bunch. Hagrid hands Harry the letter. Explains... Your parents were wizards, powerful wizards. They were killed by a wizard. Okay, You've been invited to Hogwarts. Did any of you get Hogwarts letters? How many of you were Harry Potter nerds? I mean, dyed in the wool kind of. All my kids were. I forced them. <laughs> I read them to them. I mean, they were actually like my eldest. She was reading the first Harry Potter book in second grade, I think. Her AR scores were like that. Of course, the teacher was like, we can't read that. It's too obvious. <laughs> Kids can read what they want. Um, which is why they are the way they are. <laughs> it's another topic I won't go on to. Um, where was I going? Gives Harry's letters. Anyways, Harry says to the Dursleys, You knew? You knew I'm a wizard? Page 53. Knew? No! Shrieks Aunt Petunia. Knew? No! Of course we knew. How could you not be my dreaded sister? And she just does what? Just goes off. Right. Calling her sister, like bullying, essentially bullying her sister. You, who's dead, so, you know. Just like completely trashes her. Kicking a dead dog, you know, it's, it says more about you than the dog. Completely trashes her. Why? Don't say anything about any other books. She's jealous. It's pretty clear from this she's jealous. This has been bottled up, right? I mean, this is like in that one Miyazaki film with the big guy who sucks everything up and then he has to spew it all out. I mean, this is just all this rotten filth coming out. Okay? Notice she has to stop and take a deep breath and then the rant continues, we're told, on the middle of page 53. Um, Hagrid uses the name Voldemort, doesn't like to use it. Vernon says this is on... A bunch of old tosh on page 56 says it's codswallop 59 he goes too far i am not paying for some crackpot old fool to teach him magic tricks and what does get the right name hagrid do aims his umbrella at him and says don't ever insult albus dumbledore in my presence ever again is that all he does he also puts a big stick on Dudley. Yeah. Is it aimed at Dudley? Or is he going for Vernon? I don't think he's trying to hit Dudley. I think he's aiming for Vernon. And, you know, this is Hagrid we're dealing with. Talk about somebody else who likes to put a few back every now and then. <laughs> <clears throat> His face, notice, is often described as being quite red. Rubeus. Like rubiola, like, you know, measles. 
So, Hagrid takes Harry off to this place. How do you pronounce that? Don't use this one. How do you pronounce that? Diagon Alley. Diagon Alley. Diagon Alley. Or is it Diagon? So you don't pronounce the gone part. Or is it diagonally? The reason I'm asking, how do you get to Diagon Alley? You go through the leaky cauldron. You go through the leaky cauldron. How do you get to the leaky cauldron? It's on Charing Cross Road. Major north-south, more or less, thoroughfare in London. Loaded with bookstores and other kinds of stores. There's a couple of major theaters on Charing Cross Road, including, if I remember correctly, the theater that hosted the play that shall not be named, right? Which all my students went to and had to have a big picture in front of as I took them on a walking tour. Um, our first field trip would be about a, depending on what kind of mood I was in, anywhere from a five to seven mile walking tour of London, of uh, location sites associated with the film. But because of being the kind of person I am, I was also pointing out all kinds of historical you know, things. Here's where the Romans here. Go touch that wall because it's Roman. Actual wall made by Roman. Yeah, pull off a little piece now. <laughs> As most of them did. <laughs> um, it's on Charing Cross Road between, anybody know? Supposedly between a bookstore and a music store. So I would literally, we'd walk it down and I'd have students go, bookstore, <sighs> clothing store. Because mm -hmm. you're thinking somewhere in between there, you know. So you go into the leaky cauldron and then you have to go outside and then you look at the trash can and I think that you look diagonally from that to the brick like three up. Why else this though? It's the reason I had this written down. It's something about perception of the magical world. I think. I could be entirely wrong. Probably am, but I've been teaching it this way for over 20 years. Why can muggles not see the magical world? Why can the Dursleys not see it? Other than that they don't want to. That's a huge part, by the way. How do they see reality? Straightforward. It's it. They never look at anything seemingly off to the side. They have what's called tunnel vision. So take a horse and you put those blinders on, what can the horse see? Only what is straight ahead. That's how they are. Because anything over here, it's a little odd. It's a little mysterious. You know, do this with your hands, and at some point you reach where you can't see it, or you can just barely see it, and it's like, is it really there or not? Diagonally implies perception. Okay? And how, or perspective, I should say. So, Where's the first place they go in Diagon Alley? The wine shop? Nope. No, no the robe store. Nope. Bank. Close. Bank. Why? Right. Got to have money before you can buy anything. Notice it's not a socialist alley. It's not you just go in and everybody all gets the same. Okay? You have to pay. What does Harry discover when they go into Green Knots? He's very rich. He's loaded. And if the Dursleys knew, Harry would be short for this world. You know, he'd be dead. So, we meet Grip Hook. One, seven, three nuts, three nuts. All kinds of parallels, right? Um, Harry then goes off to get measured for his robes. Where does Hagrid go? I mentioned it a moment ago. He's going to get a drink. <laughs> Why? His nerves are a bit frayed from the Warner Brothers theme park amusement ride <laughs> of Gringotts, right? Mm -hmm. I've never been to Warner Brothers. Um, I've been to the actual set, the sound stage of all that used in London. If you ever get an opportunity, go. I hate the films. I absolutely detest them. But man, are those set designs and props and the artwork mind-blowing. I mean mind-blowing in the castle you walk into the room where the castle model is and the castle model 
is probably another half the width of this room going out that way and half the room going that way. It's huge. Like from the very base of the model to the top is probably 15 or 20 feet. I mean, when I've taken students in there, they literally, all my kids did this first time. They go in there and they see it, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, tears, because of just how massive and amazing this thing is. The detail just blows your mind. Yes? Is it, is it, why do you not like the films? Is it just because, like, they tried to, they didn't show enough detail? Uh, like, if you like the set design. Oh, the set design is just amazing. Some of the casting is amazing. No, it's because of what they do with the script and what, what happens with the story. The story becomes, if you go from book one, book seven, film one, end of film eight, they change the story arc. Because of two, largely, I mean, there's a bunch of little scenes, but because of two major scenes that are removed from book seven. You take those two scenes out at the beginning of book seven and the end of book seven, and you have changed. You have, my opinion, could be wrong, you don't have to agree, reversed the story arc. I'm not gonna say how yet. I'm not gonna say what that means yet, okay? So, Harry gets measured for Rhodes. Who does he meet? Draco, Draco Malfoy. Draco asks what house he's gonna be in. Harry what he's talking about. He asked about Harry's parents. They're dead. Oh, sorry. What does Draco offer? First time, friendship. He, act, he offers friendship. And then he sees Hagrid. And he talks down to Hagrid. And Harry's like, Whew, fighting words. I like Hagrid, you know. What else do we discover about Draco there? How does he talk about Hagrid? He's a servant. Draco has kind of a high opinion of himself. And he talks about what kind of people should Hogwarts allow. Only it's the first indication. Only pure bloods. Only pure bloods. Okay. So, they go off and here he goes to get his wand. 8283. Shoot. Needed to get farther. And all of honor, and you know, it's like, oh, I knew you'd be coming soon. And then he does something really, really creepy. But you know what? He touches Harry's scar. And he kind of pretends he's E.T., you know. <laughs> I mean, hello, personal space. Back off, old dude, you know, creepy. 13 and a half inches. You, powerful wand. Why 13 or 13 and a half inches? Why is the wand not 12 or 14? Or I don't care how long it is. But why in the 13s? Friday the 13th is what? Of cursed day. Unlucky, bad day. 13 is an unlucky number. In The Hobbit, Bilbo was invited to go along with the dwarves and Gandalf. Why? So they don't have only 13. So that it's 14. Right? So Voldemort's one, 13 and a half inches. What's it made out of? You. Notice we're not told what else. Not yet. Rowling holds that back for later. You. What is you? Nine. Louder? Nine. It's, a, it's a tree. Nine. Sorry. Y E W, not E W E. <laughs> it's a kind of tree. Its leaves are poisonous. It's like a fir tree, but it's not fir. It has needles, though. But they're poisonous. Except for one animal. Deer eat yew trees. Don't say anything if you know where this is going. Um, so then Harry gets his wand. Or Ollivander asks him, what's your wand hand? Harry doesn't know. He doesn't even know what that means. He says, well, I'm right-handed. Why is he right-handed? 
flip of the coin? I don't think so. Why not left-handed? You know, many of our presidents have been left-handed. It's like a greater percentage of presidents have been left-handed than there is in our population. Obama was left-handed. I want to say either Bush 1 or Bush 2, maybe even both of them, were left-handed. Bill Clinton was left-handed. So it's like three in the last 20 years. Left-handedness is a recessive trait, all right? What else? Anybody know what left is in Latin? Sinistre. Turn around the last two letters. Sinister. If something is sinister, it's what? Yeah, not good. All right? So his right hand. So Ollivander hands him a bunch of wands. They don't do anything for him. Bottom 84. Sure, let's try. Holly and Phoenix Feather. And here he takes it, and his hand and arm feel warm. And he does this, and red and gold sparks fly out. Why red and gold? Colors of Gryffindor. Or Gryffindor, if you want. Okay? Why holly and phoenix feather? What kind of tree is holly? Anybody know? Does it lose its leaves in the winter? No, it doesn't. It is, therefore, called evergreen. Another way of putting evergreen, always living doesn't die. It has leaves that look kind of like this. And these are points. They're thorns. Prickly. Okay? Holly is often used in Christmas decorations because you have the green and what else do you have with it? Red berries. So you have corns. Uh, corns. Thorns. And notice what kind of shape this is. If this was hollow, it would be kind of like a crown, crown of thorns. And what form right here on the holly by the leaves? Red berries, blood. In the Middle Ages, the holly, holly bush, was symbolic of Christ. Okay? What's the other thing? It's ever living, has a crown of thorns, and it has red berries symbolizing blood. By the way, so is a dogwood. Dogwood blossom has its petals. They're not actually petals. Those are leaves. And each one has a little thorn-like thing on it. Okay? And then the phoenix. What is a phoenix? It isn't really bad. I mean, well, when it dies, it burns up, and then it comes back to life in the ashes. It's a bird that self-immolates. It comes a pile of ashes and, it, and the little bird starts growing again. It lives for 500 years. Does that every 500 years. All right? Middle Ages, it's symbolic all the time, again, of Christ. Go to the Trinity Church in Stratford on Avon where Shakespeare is buried, and at least 10, 15 years ago, on the altar, back in the altar area, is a um, embroidered cloth with this big old phoenix on it. You know, I will rise again. Kind of a thing. So look at Harry's wand. Evergreen, ever living, blood, thorns, dying, and rising. Journey from platform nine and three quarters. We have two minutes. Not going to say anything about other than who again <coughs> does Harry meet and who again offers help or friendship. Draco, why does Harry not take it? Because he knows how, because he can kind of sense how Draco is and he doesn't trust him. Okay, why else? Because Draco belittles Ron. And here he comes to Ron's defense. Ah, oh, a true Gryffindor. He's chivalric. He comes to the aid of the seemingly, in this case, weak. Because Harry's not really any stronger than Ron. They're both kind of weak. Okay? Sorting hat. I know we've only got like a minute left. Harry puts the hat on, page 121. Hmm, difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Now that's, that's a good, nothing negative about that. It's a rousing endorsement. 
Not a bad mind either. Yeah, that's not the greatest endorsement. That's not, that's not like, boy, you're like another Hermione Granger. A brain. Nope. What else? Talent. Oh my goodness, yes. What is talent? Not for Harry, anybody. Something you're really good at. It's raw, innate ability. Was Michael Jordan born to be an Olympic swimmer? No. What was he born to do? Play basketball. Was Michael Phelps born to play basketball? No. He was born to spend his life in a pool. You know, pretty much it. Harry has raw, innate talent. What must Michael Jordan, what did Michael Jordan have to receive and what did Michael Phelps have to receive in order to become the best at what they did? Training. Training, coaching, a lot of work. And a thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. Why does Harry have a thirst to prove himself? Because he's been put down his whole life. Okay, that's one good reason. He what else? Reputation already. He's already been told by Ron Weasley. You're Harry Potter. You're the one who defeated me. Yeah, shut up. I don't know how I did it. Okay. So he gets put in Gryffindor. And it's 11 of 6. We will pick up with the potions master. We're going to skip a lot. Because um, we need to get into Chamber of Secrets for whatever the day is. Tuesday.